بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First, Jazakum Allah khair for coming out on a cold night. May Allah reward you. And uh, I, just from experience, I will, I find myself compelled to uh, share with you a wish, a wish that uh, these numbers continue. That we keep to see these numbers with this halaqa bi idnillahi ta'ala. Now on my part, I will make a commitment bi idnillah ta'ala uh, that should be in line with the purpose of this halaqa. All right? The purpose of this halaqa. Uh, the prime purpose, come close, more than that. Bye. Ah. Bye. So the main or the prime purpose of this halaqa is really to inspire you and help you create a connection with the Qur'an. Create a connection with the Qur'an. This is a halaqa that is not meant to make you a scholar of tafsir. Further? Okay, it's not... It's not meant to make you a scholar of tafsir. We're not here uh, in order to uh, flex our knowledge muscles, how grounded anyone is in knowledge. We're not here to start showing people that, you know, I attend the halaqa and I know something about tafsir. The prime purpose is for you to take that knowledge to heart Use it to truly connect with Allah. You can only, only connect with Allah through His Word. Truly, you can only connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His Word. So if you, purpose means intention. That means you should come to this halaqa with one intention. That I am here to learn a little bit more than what I know about the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their meaning. And I want to go back home with that meaning and see how it affects my heart, how I can benefit from it to improve myself as a Muslim. That's it. Along the way, that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But don't let it overshadow the main purpose. It's very important really for every one of us to be humble here. We are all students of the Qur'an. And to be a student of the Qur'an, we have to embody the akhlaq of the Qur'an, the manners, the character that the Qur'an teaches. And the Qur'an teaches humility. The Qur'an teaches curiosity for the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Aisha radiallahu anha, described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when she was asked about his general manner of character. She said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran." His general demeanor, his character was the Qur'an. It was the Qur'an. So it was an, an embodiment, a human manifestation of the Qur'an. And that's what we want. That's the purpose to learn the Qur'an. Now, why are we here as a general goal? To fulfill an obligation. To fulfill an obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, it's a blessed book that we send down to you, O Muhammad, with the purpose, يَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ so that they contemplate, they reflect on, they meditate over the verses, its verses. So actually contemplating the Qur'an, understanding it, absorbing its meanings, trying to figure out how they apply to your life, how they apply to your behavior, how they apply to the things you believe in, the things you hold dearly. That's an obligation. In this day and age, with a lot of emphasis on academia and intellectuality, we have lost the role of the heart. People think their connection with the heart, is with the Qur'an is recitation. 
People think, oh, it's just reading the Qur'an. But we have forgotten that the cultural use of the word understand or read, recite the Qur'an, yatlu or yaqra'u al-Qur'an, in the early generations it meant, it meant reading with contemplation, engaging with the Qur'an, engaging with the meaning. And when you say reflection, it means you are reflecting the meanings of the Qur'an on yourself. And you are reflecting your own uniqueness in the Qur'an in the sense you're seeing how the Qur'an applies to you. How you can implement this. What kind of faults you have or shortcomings that the Qur'an can fix for yourself. What room for improvement there is in you that the Qur'an can actually provide something about. So it's an obligation. Allah sent the Qur'an not for us just to read it in the modern meaning of the word read, but actually to read and contemplate, engage at a deep level if you like, a full kind of engagement with the words of Allah. So that's yadabbaru. So it's an obligation. It's not a luxury. It's not something that you're doing as a, as a favor to Allah. It's an obligation upon you. So when someone reads the Qur'an, that's what it means. You read the Qur'an, you reflect on their meanings. But we have limited that to just reading the Qur'an. So you find the people are just going through the Qur'an reading. Those who can read the Arabic language, they're, they're just counting pages. They're just count, they can't wait to get till the end of the surah. They can't wait to get till the end of the juz. Jazakallah khair. They can't wait to, to finish the Qur'an. At least they can you know, put on their... Uh, calendar or on their uh, journal, I read the Qur'an once more. What really counts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the Qur'an is how your heart is engaged with it. That's the point. And the reward, the promised reward, the Prophet ﷺ says, كُلُّ حَرْفٍ بِعَشْرِ حَسَنَاتِ Every letter of the, of the Qur'an that you read gives you ten rewards. ولا أقول ألف حرف لام حرف ميم حرف ولا أقول ألف لام ميم حرف لكن ألف حرف لام ميم لام حرف ميم حرف. The Prophet ﷺ said for each letter in the Quran there is ten حسنات. And I don't say ألف لام ميم is حرف but ألف is حرف لام is حرف ميم is حرف. What does the Prophet ﷺ this promised reward is not just by reading without meaning because reading in the Arabic language what is language there is المبنى and al-ma'na mabna and ma'na structure and meaning this structure holds or encapsulates meaning so the words the mabna the structure is the share of what your tongue and your ears al-ma'na the meaning the wisdom is what is the part that belongs to your heart. So when you are reading the Quran and you are stuck only with the mabna, which is the structure, but you're not absorbing the meanings, you're not engaging with the meanings, you're not doing the full tilawa, you're not doing the full qira'a. So you're missing out on the great reward. And the Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith, لا تقرأ القرآن do not read the Qur'an in rush. Do not read the Qur'an in a state of rush. Just like what? In the same quality, there is, there is a type of, of dates called daqal. Daqal. You know the very cheap dates that are almost rotten? They're squashed, squeezed. They're of very poor quality. This is called the daqal. Okay? It's the cheapest of all type of uh, dates, the lowest nutritional value, and even, you know, visually it's not, a, uh, it's not pleasing. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not read the Qur'an rushing through it, that you turn, it, you turn this experience into the quality of a daqal, a low quality kind of, of dates. So what we want to do here is try to contemplate the meanings. 
try to contemplate the meanings with the purpose of seeing how this can help us, this can, this, how does this apply to our lives, how can this improve me as a Muslim. That's it. So a recommendation, do not get in debates and fights as to what this means, what that means, maybe with a friend or a colleague or someone. Oh, no, no, this is what it means, that's what it means, this is what the Shaykh said, this is what the Shaykh said. No, forget about all of that. Really just focus on improving yourself as a believer. Now, these are introductory notes that will help us, inshallah, just you know, create a general map of what we're doing here. We chose Tafsir al-Sa'di. Tafsir al-Imam al-Sa'di. Imam al-Sa'di is, again, he is the teacher, the main teacher of uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Uthaymeen. And uh, maybe about five years ago, uh, we, we actually explained or commented on a book by Imam al-Sa'di. It's for anyone who hasn't attended that, hasn't seen that, uh, you can find it on the YouTube channel of Abu Huraira. It's called uh, The Beneficial Means to a Happy Life. There is a short booklet by Imam al-Sa'di, The Beneficial Means to a Happy Life. We went over the book with some kind of commentary, we, and we tried to make it practical. So at the beginning of that series, we spoke, we actually had a full session on the life of Imam al-Sa'di. So we're not going to repeat that again. Anyone who would like to see it, you can check the YouTube channel, bi'ithnillah ta'ala, and you will find uh, a good summary of the life of Imam al-Sa'di. And it would really help you connect with his book. Uh, the, the manner in which the class is going to be, or the halaqa is going to be organized, is simply, I'm going to read a paragraph from the original Arabic text, and then the brother here is going to read the English translation. By the way, the book has been translated into English, I believe into 10 volumes, uh, and uh, it's available as PDF. I'm not sure if it's a, a, a legitimate kind of copy, copy online, but I assume if the publisher wouldn't want that, they would have at least fought it because it's available on so many websites, all right? So I would say it would be very helpful for you to uh, download it and follow with us, it would help you. But still you can see it on the, uh, on the screen, but it would help you when you go back home and I would recommend, I would recommend you actually take time during the week to go over whatever we have covered. That would be very helpful. Uh, something about the tafsir of al-Sa'di and the, the reason why we chose it uh, is that it's, uh, it's not an, um, a lengthy tafsir. It's, it leans more towards the shorter tafsir. It's not too short, but it leans more towards the shorter tafsir. Yet, the reflections of Imam al-Sa'di are extremely profound and very helpful. That's why we chose it. This is why we chose it. It's actually, it's, a, it's like at least in my own personal taste, it's really been one of the most uh, impactful tafsir that I have ever dealt with. So this is why I thought it would be very beneficial to go over it. And it would be an opportunity as well for, for those who would like to attend, uh, and all those who would attend online as well, to go over a book of tafsir. Which is really a great pity if a Muslim lives their all, whole life and they've never gone through a tafsir. This is an opportunity. And I would really emphasize and encourage you to attend in person. It, it, it is better for your commitment to this class. Because if you say, I'll watch it online, you will probably watch it live, but then eventually you'd say, I'll watch the recording. Then when it's recorded, you would say, you know, I'm busy, I'll watch it next week. Then next week. Then you have three, four, five sessions that you haven't watched. Then it becomes too much for you to watch. Forget about it, maybe, you know, next year. And you would most miss out on an opportunity. You know, big tasks, when you break them down into small tasks, especially spread over time and nicely inserted into your, you know, busy schedule, it's really, this is the easiest way to accomplish big tasks and big things. And the scholars have recognized this from a long time. Uh, the companions of the Allah anhum would do this. Umar al-Khattab anhu described how they learned the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet He said, we were busy people. We had to work, but we decided that I, everyone would work every other day. 
and then we formed ourselves into pairs. Two people would actually join together as partners, and then one would attend with the day with the Prophet ﷺ and learn from the behavior, from the teachings, from the incidents that are happening. And uh, the other person would be working during the day. Then they would meet at night, and the person who attended with the Prophet ﷺ would teach the other person, share that knowledge. Then the following day, the person who went to, to work for either in the farm or the market, they would spend the day with the Prophet ﷺ where the other person would go for work, for their livelihood. And then at night they would do the same thing. They would sit together and he would teach him what he learned. And he said, this is how we learn. So over time they learned a lot. There is a very fam famous line of poetry that is always taught to students of knowledge as they begin. And it's actually, it's, it's quite... Uh, it's quite helpful and so much to the point. It says, it's two lines of poetry. The poet says, اليوم علم وغدا مثله من نتف العلم التي تلتقط يحصل المرء بها حكمة وما السيل إلا اجتماع النقط Today, a little bit of knowledge. And tomorrow, a similar amount of knowledge. Little bit. From the small bits and pieces of knowledge that can be picked up, a person eventually would accumulate a huge amount of knowledge from those. And the ravine, in reality, or the stream, is made of the drops of water that fall from the sky. So that's an analogy. A drop over a drop over a drop over a drop doesn't seem to be much. But over time, you would actually start to notice that a puddle of water is, is forming up. Then eventually, this might flow and form a stream. So this is how knowledge is. And there was a famous Hanafi scholar, I forgot his first name, but this Hanafi scholar tried to study the knowledge of Islam, fiqh specifically, for a long time. And he didn't achieve much. He didn't get much. And one day he was wondering, he was really contemplating, you know, giving up uh, seeking knowledge altogether. He said, probably it's, I'm not meant for that. I don't, I don't seem to, ha to have a head for this. So it's better that I invest my life in something, in something else. He wasn't achieving any progress. As he was contemplating that, and he's walking down the street, he sees that there is a tank of water that is leaking. And drops of water are falling one after the other. Then he sees at the bottom, there is a rock. And he, he looks at the rock. The rock, the shape of the rock has been changed, has been carved by the drops falling over a long period of time. Then he made a very interesting observation. He said, الْمَاءُ عَلَى لَطَافَتِهِ أَثَّرَ فِي الصَّخْرَةِ عَلَى صَلَابَتِهَا أَفَلَا يُؤَثِّرُ الْعِلْمُ عَلَى قُوَّتِهِ فِي هَذَا الْقَلْبِ أَوْ هَذَا الْعَقْلِ عَلَى قَسَاوَتِهِ He said, the, the drops of water, despite their softness, changed or overwhelmed the hardness of the rock. So, what about the droplets of knowledge, despite their strength and potency? Aren't they able to create a shape or change the shape of a mind or a heart that has been hardened. Then he went back to studying again with a new spirit, a new insight. That's the importance of insight, a new understanding. And he actually became one, uh, one of the like, prominent scholars of the Hanafi Madhab. So that's how we deal with knowledge. Usually the general behavior of, student, of people who attend classes is that excitement at the beginning Right? Just like the New Year resolutions, right? Everyone is buying this, these gym memberships and so on and so forth and putting plans and buying apps and softwares and programs and memberships and so on and so forth. Then, you know, they start very, like, excited, thinking they can take on the whole world. But eventually what happens? 
They start skipping one at a time, one at a time, then eventually they give up on the whole thing. So the uh, gym membership is a waste of money. Uh, whatever they started with, uh, the, the, the beautiful dreams evaporate. You know, and then it becomes a painful experience. You know, any task you get into, any task you get into, you're going to have this fresh excitement. Why? Because humans love fresh starts and beginnings. It's not, we think, oh, I'm going to change everything now. All of a sudden, I'm going to become a studious person. I'm going to become an achiever. I'm going to do something right, finally, in my life. But you know what? Your personal habits are going to creep back. This is uh, the uh, deep government within you, right? It creeps in. It has taken hold. Why? Because you can't work against the dynamics of your human nature. You have to understand them. So you can work with them better. So if you want to learn just because, oh, it's a nice opportunity to learn something new. Finally, I'm just going to read a book in Tafsir or go over it together, etc. You know, uh, this kind of fancy dream uh, does not hold, you know, that place for a long time. Slowly it's going to evaporate. Slowly it will lose the freshness. So you need to tap into something that is deeper in you. Something deeper that will guarantee that you will be committed. That when you feel that you don't want to come to the halaqa, you know, you have the decisiveness to say, I'm going to go no matter what. That when you have temptation to go and spend time probably with your, with your friends, with family, or go on a trip, and there's a promise of enjoyment, fun, you're going to say, you know what? I have a commitment. And it's about the book of Allah, and it's about my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to do that for the sake of Allah. Maybe I don't enjoy it. Maybe the tafsir is not interesting. Maybe the shaykh that's speaking, I don't like their personal style. That's, that's all possible. Right? Or maybe I just got used to the you know, same, same kind of style. I need something new. So the temptation, you know, shaitan, when, when shaitan sees, and Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum, subhanAllah, had this observation. When shaitan sees the hype, he doesn't work against you. Because he understands human dynamics. He's a, like a masterful manipulator. He doesn't push against you. You know, it's just like those martial arts, like judo, jujitsu. Like, he uses your momentum against you. When you're woken up on someone, they're not going to push against you. But they're going to let you get momentum and speed that they will use it to trip you. Shaitan, that's what shaitan does. So Ibn Abbas, عنهما, he said, Inna shaytana yashummu qalb ibn Adam. Shaitan sniffs around. He smells your heart. He tries to sense it out. What's going on in this heart? What's going on in this heart? What is it? فَإِنْ وَجَدَ إِقْبَالًا عَلَى اللَّهِ أَخَذَ بِهِ إِلَى الْغُلُوِّ وَالْبِدْعَةِ If he finds the person is excited and they are so enthusiastic, he's not going to push against that. He's going to use it. Use it to what? Make you over-enthusiastic and push you to overdo things where you fall into bid'ah. And that's where he wants you to go. وَإِنْ رَأَى تَعَلُّقًا بِالدُّنْيَا وَإِقْبَالًا عَلَى الدُّنْيَا جَذَبَهُ إِلَى الْمَعَاصِ But if he sees that you are more inclined to the dunya, he will help you, push you in the direction of the desires of this world. Shaitan doesn't like to do hard work. He's, he's against it. He likes to do intelligent work. So, Shaitan sees that you have come to the class excited. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm telling you, believe me. It's not going to be fun. Let me be blunt. It's not going to be fun. Knowledge is hard. Yes. Just like getting fit is hard. You have to grind. You have to do it when everything in your system says, No, I can't do it. This is how scholars have become scholars. This is how advanced students of knowledge became advanced students of knowledge. Really. By grinding. 
When their self says no, they say yes, you have to. When shaitan pushes against that, they say, you know, we're not going to give up. I'm just going to commit and, and I'm just going to go. How do you think Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu ta'ala would not even go to sleep? Now, I don't advise anyone to do that. It's not good for your health. But he was someone who would only sleep as in, only when he gets overwhelmed by sleep. Like he's reading, he's studying, and he just dozes off. That's his sleep. So when he wakes up, done, over. Call them power naps if you like. How could someone do that? How could someone do that? He actually, I think it was him, or someone from an earlier generation, he said, I was in, no, someone else. I was in Baghdad, he said, I was in Baghdad studying. He was from another city, he was in Baghdad studying for so many years. I don't remember how many years, but he said, he said, for years I wanted to eat fish, but I had no time for it. <laughs> I had no time to eat fish. So one day we had a halaqa, and it was after Fajr. And our sheikh was ill. So we went to the market, bought a fish. We wanted to prepare it to cook it at home. So we were, it took us time more than we anticipated to prepare it. So the time for the next class before Dhuhr was drawing near. And we hadn't cooked the fish yet. So we ate it raw. <laughs> and we went to the class. That's how these people achieve knowledge. That's how these people achieve knowledge. So if you think you're, it's going to be just fun, no, it's not going to be fun. You might experience moments of fun, yes, but I'll tell you where the fun comes, where it comes into the process. When you have committed for a long time, you've pushed against the desires, against the temptation to quit, to give up, to skip the halaqa, all right? And say, you know, tomorrow, next week, right? Once you push and, you know, never slip for the first period, let's say first few months, you're going to enter a phase where the tafsir becomes so much fun. But you have to pay that price first. And this happens, by the way, with everything of true value. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah ta'ala, is qiyam al-layl, praying at night. He said, كَابَدْتُ قِيَامَ اللَّيْلِ عِشْرِينَ سَنَةً ثُمَّ تَمَتَّعْتُ بِهِ عِشْرِينَ سَنَةً He said, I fought, I strove to stick to قيام اللَّيْل meaning I pushed myself, I forced myself on قيام اللَّيْل for 20 years. 20 years. Not a week, not a month, not a year, not even 10 years. 20 years, could you imagine that? Waking up at night, leaving sleep when you're tired. And, you wanna in, and sleep is the most tempting at that time. Leaving your bed, leaving the sheets, standing up, praying, reading Quran, and not feeling anything, anything, but keeping at it for 20 years. So he said, for 20 years, I pushed myself on Qiyam al-Layl and then I enjoyed it for subsequent 20 years. That's how these things work. So one understand this kind of dynamic. This is how it is with knowledge. Really, the, the, the creme of the knowledge, the beauty of knowledge, you know, comes when you start doing synthesis. There is an excitement at the beginning, but it fades away. I promise you, week three, week four, you know, you're going to start experiencing a lot of boredom, disinterest. What you thought was going to be a very rosy, romantic experience with Tafsir al-Sa'di is going to turn into a trauma. I promise. But if you are not willing to push through that and stick to it and commit and not let your feelings play with you, but let your decisiveness lead the way, you're not going to make it through to that phase when you're going to find, when you're going to experience the enjoyment and the sweetness of the Quran tenfold of what you experienced at the beginnings. This is why the scholars, by the way, you know what they said, they, another famous statement uh, that is usually shared with students of knowledge when they begin. مَنْ كَانَتْ بِدَايَاتُهُ مُحْرِقَةً 
كانت نهاياته مشرقة من كانت بداياته محرقة كانت بداياته كانت نهاياته مشرقة whoever has burnt out beginnings they're gonna have very illuminated brightful endings meaning if you grind in the beginning you, you burn yourself in the beginning right you're gonna have the beautiful ends but if you want it easy and enjoyable at the beginning you're not gonna see the brightness you're gonna stay in the darkness and Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says وَقَدْ أَجْمَعَ الْعُقَلَاءُ أَنَّ الرَّاحَةَ لَا تُنَالُ بِالْرَّاحَةَ he said, all rational, reasonable people are agreed that Arraha rest, cannot be achieved with rest. By resting, you will not achieve rest. You can only achieve rest when you grind and work hard. That's how it works. Okay? So these are important uh, introductions, inshallah, bi ta'ala. To make it easy, more relatable, again, we're trying to facilitate as much as possible. Uh, we decided to start with Juzu Amma, and we deci decided to start from the end of Juzu Amma, the shorter surahs. And the way we're going to do it again, we're not necessarily going to go in Surah Al Nas, then Surah Al Falaq, then Surah Al Samad, but we're going to actually take them from Al Samad to Al Falaq to Al Nas because these three surahs have a very strong connection and it makes more sense to start with Al Samad. Then eventually we can go in that reverse order with the other surahs. So uh, something about the structure of this class is going to be uh, that I will read a, a paragraph from the Arabic. The brother will read the translation in English. Uh, we'll make very short commentary until we finish the surah. When we finish the surah or with longer surahs, when we finish the segment for that specific week, what we're going to do is we're going to have a second half of the class where we are going to freestyle. Freestyle about what? We draw benefit from the surah. Things that are applicable to, the, to our daily life, some linguistic reflections, some fiqhi lessons, some aqidah, you know, points that we can take, we can draw. Okay? And then eventually, at the end, we're going to leave some time for questions. And something about questions, please make sure the questions are... Uh, limited or they pertain only to the content of the halaqa. They pertain or they are only like about the same theme as the halaqa. Or at least the Quran and its tafsir in general. Anything else? You know, we're not going to entertain it here. Uh, something else. If you have a question, ask it in the halaqa. Because after the halaqa, I'm not answering any questions in person. All right? Uh, yeah, we can. Let's begin. Since we are all here and you're all excited, let's use that, inshallah. And let's let you go home saying, you know, yeah, we thought we came to a class of tafsir, we ended up with a lecture. <laughs> all right. So, khair, inshallah. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Tafsiru Surat al Ikhlas. Wahiya Makkiya. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد أي قل قولا جازما به معتقدا له عارفا بمعناه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم say with certain faith believing in it and understanding its meaning he Allah is one that is, he is the one and okay. unique. Okay, hold on. That's it. That's yeah. what we got. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, it's not only say, again, just as we described at the beginning, the Qur'an is not only words, the words and their meanings, and the reflections, the lessons that you take, and then the implementation, and then you turn that into a lifestyle. So say with certainty, jaziman bihi. Meaning that you believe that in your heart. You don't just say it as lip service. Your heart says it as the, at the same time. Your heart believes in it. Jaziman bihi. Jazim means you are certain. 
It's confirmed. You have no doubt about it. Mu'taqidan lahu. That you actually embrace that certainty. You embrace it. Mu'taqidan. You believe in it. You believe in it. It has turned into what? A given to you. It's not something that needs proof anymore. Arifan bima'nahu. Knowing what it means. Yep. قل هو الله أحد أي قد انحصرت فيه الأحدية فهو الأحد المنفرد بالكمال الذي له الأسماء الحسنى والصفات الكاملة العليا والأفعال المقدسة الذي لا نظير له ولا مثيل له He Allah is one that is he is the one and unique to whom alone belongs utmost perfection to him belongs the most beautiful names and perfect sublime attributes and his deeds are far above any shortcomings he has no counterparts and no equals so again in hasalat fihi al-ahadiyya he's the only one who has this ahadiyya now in the the translation they could not convey this without elaboration and they wanted it to be straightforward al-ahadiyya al-ahadiyya what does it mean this uniqueness this divine uniqueness this divine uniqueness. Uh, so uh, he says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he, uh, he is Allah, one. Not the one, not al-ahad, one. Because there's many ones in the world, right? In existence, there's many ones. But there is a specific type of oneness. What is it? He explains it here. Huwa al-ahadu al-munfaridu bil kamal. He's the only one who's perfect in every sense. He's complete and perfect. He has the most beautiful names. Mark these ones. This is his kamal. This is his perfection. The most beautiful, complete names. The attributes, as-sifat. And al-af'al, the actions. These are the three things that we understand about Allah. Or actually, these are the things that the Quran speaks about when it comes to Allah. That, Allah himself. The self of Allah. Allah Himself as an entity. Allah. Al that. Al Asma. The names of Allah. How many of the names of Allah do we have? How many are the names of Allah? Are they limited to 99? No, there is more. So the hadith that is in a Tirmidhi. It says there are 90 names of Allah that whoever knows them, memorizes them, lives according to them will enter Jannah. It doesn't say the names of Allah are only 99. It says there are 99 names of the names of Allah. The names of Allah are way beyond. You know, for example, in the dua, the Prophet ﷺ taught us, Allahumma as'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak. Allah, Allah, I ask you by every name of yours. Samayta bihi nafsak, that you have given to yourself. Aw anzaltahu fi kitabik, or you revealed a new book. Aw allamtahu ahadam min khalqik, or you taught to any of your creation. Aw istathrta bihi fi ilmi al-ghaybi indak, or you kept to yourself. So that means the names are way beyond what we know. Alright? So, that, the self of Allah, the names, the attributes, and the actions of Allah. All of those are perfect and divine and unique. Allah is perfect, unique and complete in all of those four respects. Okay? This is what he's talking about. He's Al-Ahad. Allahu samad ay al-maqsood fi jami' al-hawa'ij. Fa ahlu al-'alam al-'ulwi wa as-sufli muftaqirun ilayhi ghayat al-iftiqar. Yas'alunahu hawa'ijahum wa yarghabun ilayhi fi mahammatihim aw fi muhimmatihim li'annahu al-kamil fi awsafihi العليم الذي قد كمل في علمه الحليم الذي قد كمل في حلمه الرحيم الذي كمل في رحمته الذي وسعت رحمته كل شيء وهكذا سائر أوصافه تفضل الله هو الصعب by all to meet all needs كريم the inhabitants of both the upper and lower lower realms are in the utmost need of him they ask him for what they need and turn to him regarding that which concerns them because he is the only one 
who is perfect in his attributes, the all-knowing, who is perfect in his knowledge, forbearing, who is perfect in his forbearance, the most merciful, who is perfect in his mercy, whose mercy encompasses all things, and so on. Yeah. With his attributes. Yeah. So Allah is Samad. As-Samad. As-Samad. What does that mean? He explains this briefly. Something about, by the way, Tafsir of As-Sa'di. And uh, subhanAllah, in one of the uh, handwritten manuscripts of the book, written by the author himself, he has on the cover, he says, know that, اعلم أنني قد ذكرت في هذا التفسير ما خطر على البال ساعة كتابته ولم أتقصد تتبع المسائل وتحريرها something around this so he said know that I did I wrote this tafsir with whatever came to my mind when I sat to read, to to comment on the verses I did not seek to write everything and to capture everything so this is why it, this tafsir was quite spontaneous, uh, relatively brief. So as-samad, what does as-samad mean? As-samad. Linguistically, as-samad means, by the way, something that is not hollow. It's filled. It doesn't have an inner space. That's linguistic. But it has other meanings as well. Something similar for those who speak Arabic. By the way, inshallah, in this tafsir, I'm going to pick your minds with a little bit of linguistics, especially in the Arabic language. There's a beautiful intelligence in the Arabic language that shows wonderful meanings between words, sounds, letters, meanings, combinations of, we of meanings, and shadows of meanings. So, uh, samad, sumud in the Arabic language. Sumud, what does sumud mean? Those who know the Arabic language. Sumud, Samada, fi wajhi al Samada. Yeah, to stay firm and strong in the face of the enemy, for example. In the face of hardships, Samada. Samad, Sumud. To stand tall and, you know, don't waver. So it shows there is strength, right? So that's a shadow of meaning. But, Shaykh al Sadi here takes us to the gist of the meaning. What is it? الصمد هو الذي يصمد إليه في الحوائج أو تصمد إليه الخلائق بحوائجها meaning the creation turns to Allah to answer their needs that they of themselves they can't answer their needs food comes from Allah health comes from Allah air breathing comes from Allah growth comes from Allah our creation comes from Allah so we need Allah and we call upon him even those who don't believe in Allah, you know, how do they sustain their bodies? They use the provision of Allah. They use the food of Allah, the food that Allah gave them. And they use the process of nutrition that Allah created. Like they can't come up with a new or invent a new way of what? Uh, nourishing themselves. You can't. Except for the ways that Allah enabled in the body. So they turn to Him. As-Samad. So Allah is one, He's perfect in Himself. Now this verse explains what? The relationship between the creation and Allah. First one, Allah is Al-Ahad. Second one is As-Samad, relationship. Meaning, the whole creation depends on Him for its existence, for its sustenance, for its continuity, for everything. That's As-Samad. And He answers them and He gives them because he is the most, he's an ahad, because he's complete, he's perfect. وَمِنْ كَمَالِهِ أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ لِكَمَالِ غِنَائِهِ أو لِكَمَالِ غِنَاهُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ لَا فِي أَسْمَائِهِ وَلَا فِي أَوْصَافِهِ وَلَا فِي أَفْعَالِهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى فَهَذِهِ السُّورَةُ مُشْتَمِلَةٌ عَلَى تَوْحِيدِ الْأَسْمَاءِ وَالصِّفَاتِ yep. In his perfection, he begets not, nor was he begotten because he is completely independent of means and there is none comparable to him either in his names, attributes, or deeds blessed and exalted be he yeah. There's one, is there anyone? There's one statement left 
The surah refers to the oneness of the divine names and attributes. Yeah. Okay, so Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. He doesn't beget nor is he begotten. He was not born and he doesn't give birth. Why? Because he's unique. Why, why does Allah equip the creation with reproduction? Because what? Because they're mortals. They die. They can't continue. So if Allah created humans and they cannot you know, reproduce, what's going to happen? The human race is going to come to an end. Just one lifespan and it's gone. So that's a weakness of the human beings. Uh, the jinn the jinn live for longer times, right? Maybe thousands of years. Some, uh, there are some, again, accounts that some jinn live for sometimes 100,000 years. But eventually they're going to die. So they reproduce so that they can continue. Trees don't live forever. Right? So they reproduce and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since he's Okay, he's complete. He doesn't need reproduction because it's a sign of weakness. Number two, if he were to have children, he would not be unique. Because the if a, if a divine, which is a contradiction in terms, if a divine reproduces, produces children, then the children have to be divine. So there's no oneness. And what that tells you as well shadow of meaning, a beautiful shadow of meaning here is لم يلد ولم يولد He has no beginning, no end. He is of a different type to everything you know. Everything you know has a beginning and has an end and it's limited within time brackets. So everything you know is of a finite nature. Everything. That's what you experience. That's what you've seen. That's what you have, you've heard. That's what you have studied. That's what you have come across. All the creation has a beginning and has an end. That's one type. Another type is the creator of all of this. No beginning, no end. So you're talking about something different. So when you talk about Allah, you can't use the same system that you use for the creation. You're dealing with something else, with a different type now. Has no beginning, no end. Allah has always existed. Can you even fathom that? Allah has always existed. There was no time when Allah was not. As in Sahih al-Bukhari, كَانَ اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ مَعَهُ أَوْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ There was Allah and there was nothing else. So there was no time, no matter how you go backwards in time. There is no time when Allah was not. You can't even, your brain, your mind, your intellect cannot even figure that out. Because you're talking about a different type now, different type of existence. That there's only one in that type, Allah. And there is no end as well. It's not, he's not gonna, he's not, there will be no time when Allah is no longer there. Actually, the concept of time, and that's interesting about how we are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time itself was created by Allah. So how was it when there was no time? And notice I said, how was it when there was no time? I didn't say, how was it before there was time? Because you can't say before when there is no time. You see, well, we're getting into an area we can't deal with. We can't even understand. We can't even relate to. That's Allah. When you raise your hands, because you, Allah is a samad, you're turning to Him in your needs. That's who you're talking to. When you study His words, that's whose words you're studying. When you're praying, that's the one you're standing before. It's a completely different kind of existence. And you need to appreciate that greatness, that glory, the infinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to understand that. You need to appreciate it. It's interesting how we stand in salah and we're busy with finite things and we forget about the infinite. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakun lahu kufu wan ahad. 
and there is no one who is equal, rival, or even comparable or clo close, close to him. In any sense, in any way. Everything, everything is different from him. He's the only unique one. This is why one of the companions of Allah, anhu, he used to read this surah so often. And he would, in every rak'ah, once he finished his recitation, he would read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ Companions thought, you know, we didn't see the Prophet ﷺ do this. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, so and so, you know, he, he keeps reciting Surah uh, Al-Samad or Al-Ikhlas. And by the way, the Surah has many names. Uh, at the end of every rak'ah, the Prophet ﷺ said, go and ask him why. So they asked him. So the man said, إِنِّي أُحِبُّهَا فَإِنَّ فِيهَا صِفَةُ الرَّحْمَةِ أو فَإِنَّهَا صِفَةُ الرَّحْمَةِ I love it. I have this connection, this love to this surah because it describes Allah. It mentions the qualities of Allah. So they told the Prophet وسلم, and the Messenger وسلم, said أَخْبِرُوهُ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّهُ Tell them, inform him that Allah loves him. This is قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحْدٍ and this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, تَعْدِيلُ ثُلُثَ الْقُرْآنِ It is equal to a third of the Qur'an in reward. And why again some scholars ex expounded on this? They said, because the Qur'an is made, uh, addresses three main themes. Allah tells us about Allah, about His names, attributes, and actions. Right? Asma, Sifat, Af'al. And tells us about the creation of Allah and tells us about the previous nations three main themes so three thirds this surah captures and encapsulates and summarizes the most important third which is the names and attributes of Allah and that's why it was equal to the third of the Quran third of the Quran. This surah sets the stage, by the way, for the two other surahs. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ بِإِنِّ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Next Saturday, we're going to um, take the freestyle on this surah a little bit, see how it relates to our lives, because it's actually, it could give you a lot of shifts in your perception of the world and in yourself. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَحَدٍ the, the second shortest surah, probably second or third shortest surah in the Quran. It can really create so many shifts in your life and uh, it will help you, inshallah, relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Relate, relate more because when Allah introduces Himself, by the way, you know why this surah was mentioned and we're going to close with this, bi'ithnillah ta'ala. And sorry, today we didn't take uh, questions, but we, inshallah, we will, I'll give you extra time next week, bi'ithnillah ta'ala. Quraysh came to the Prophet وسلم, and you know Quraysh and those Arabs at the time, they're very, very obsessed with their ancestry, right? Their, their family tree, where we came from, who is the great grandfather and so on and so forth. We are better than you, we are better than you and all that stuff. So everything, they would see it through this lens. So again, the Prophet وسلم, although they knew Allah, but they were trying to accuse the Prophet وسلم, that he came to preach the message of another God other than the one that they know, because for them, who they worshipped was the God of Ibrahim. So they wanted to frame the Prophet وسلم, or depict him as someone who came with to call people, invite people to worship another God. Again, just like today some Christians uh, try to claim that Muslims invite to the worship of a different God other than the true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, they said, Ya Muhammad, insib lana rabbak. O Muhammad, what is the lineage of your God? What is the ancestry of your God? Again, mockery, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah. قُلْ سَيِّ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدٍ This is who Allah. It's not what you think. It's not even the way you're asking. That's how you relate to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, it's time for Isha. Jazakumullah khairan again. Bi'idhnillah, it's going to be um, from here till Ramadan. Yeah, we're going to do it before, uh, before Isha, starting at 7 sharp. Bi'idhnillah ta'ala. And I would recommend you download the PDF 
and uh, inshallah we're just going to follow this kind of style we read comment then we take some freestyle jazakumullah khairan wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam